before we, we start the meeting. It's just to say that this is the first virtual meeting of the Financial Resource Committee. And um, I thank you, I want to thank you for your attendance today. I hope, um, I need to say, I hope that you and all your family are doing well um, at this particular COVID situation. We got told yesterday that um, officially that was six months yesterday. I couldn't believe it. I spoke to one or two people and kind of believe that that times went, went in at that. But just a couple of wee things. We're still learning about virtual, virtual meetings. So can I ask you to make sure once we get started, please um, uh, keep your mute on, obviously, unless you um, uh, want to speak. Um, like other meetings so far, I think it's been helpful that when we're going through the agenda, if you can agree the recommendations, um, rather than going through all you know, the hands and everything else, if, um, if we can agree that silence is an acceptance, and, and if that's fine, and, uh, there is absolutely no doubt, if that's not the case, you'll let me know, and I've not got a problem with that. Um, that uh, you will note the email that you got from Andrew, that um, we're going to try a new voting system um, if we need it. And uh, with that, if the answer if it fails, um, then we'll revert back to, to the roll call. Um, there's some days left on mic. Um, they're, they're, they're mute off. Are we okay? Andrew, can you see anybody? Are we okay? Are everybody muted the way they should be? Apologies, Kevin. I think that might have been me. <laughs> I heard a click click, so um, I will blame you uh, uh, anyway. Just to say that um, if everybody turns up, there's, there's going to be nearly 50 people at this meeting. And it's impossible for me to actually see everybody on the screen. I won't be able to see you. So I need you to use a chat bar. Andrew and I will be keeping an eye um, on that. And I think it's the right way to do it. I think we've, we've all had a few meetings and, and, and we've, we've now got an understanding of how we should um, go ahead with that. Convener, Councillor uh, Lyndon has just asked for a point of clarity on something. OK, Jordan. Thanks very much, Convener. Um, just that point you've made around the testing of the new voting system. Um, I raised this with the monitoring officer and the head of Democratic Services. Um, the protocol for remote meetings was agreed by full council um, and it was agreed that um, all votes would be conducted by a roll call vote on digital. Um, to depart from that would be a change in approach. Um, could we perhaps ask the, the committee clerk on what basis um, that decision has been taken. And Bevy, did you get any feedback, uh, Jordan, on that from the monitoring officer? Uh, I got, got confirmation that it is a departure from the protocol that was agreed at full council. Uh, but beyond that, uh, no, I can't say I did. Okay, and Andrew, you get anything on that? It, well, I would say then is if um, mem members have um, concerns with using that system, we'll revert to roll call vote um, until okay. council has had the chance to consider that. Um, okay. Can I? Wish to pilot something to try it. Um, if the members here are not happy with it, I will not go ahead with it. But I thought, um, uh, as a matter of uh, looking at making things better, that we could have tried it on a pilot basis only for this meeting. Would you be happy to accept that? Um, just th through your convener, um, the leader of the SNP groups articulating the position, um, and uh, no, uh, the position was agreed. So, which would be that votes would be conducted by a roll call vote until such time as full council arrives at a different position. Uh, that's exactly what should continue to happen. We will now continue with a roll call vote. I've made that decision. Okay. Um, Thanks, convener. Uh, okay, uh, okay, Jordan. Um, just uh, and again, I've emphasised this again. Before we before we start, please use your mute um, button um, appropriately because um, there's a lot of us online now, and it only takes one. And you know what happens um, with that. Finally, moving on, we've got 25 items on the uh, agenda, and we've got much to discuss. So, Andrew, um, first of all, um, the, the normal situation. Um, apologies. Um, have we have any apology and any name subs? Yes, convener. So I've got a couple of apologies from Councillor Mc McNeil, who will be substituted by Councillor Kelly, Councillor Castles, who's been substituted by Councillor Duffy, Councillor Curry, and Councillor Logue. Members, have you any other apologies from your groups? No? Okay. 
Um, just to, the final thing, you know that I, I, I always say this, while we're on mute and your phone goes, you won't hear it, but if you're speaking, so try and make sure your phone's in silent or off before we, we start. Okay, item one, um, getting into the part is uh, the declaration of uh, interest. Is there any declaration? Chair, Chair, apologies before you move on. I was having trouble with my mic there. Uh, it wasn't it wasn't like you think for some reason, don't know why. Um, can I register apologies for Councillor Lennon? Sorry. Andrew, have you got that? Yes, I have. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, Chair. Well, not a problem. Uh, agenda item, uh, sorry, agenda item one, the declaration of interest. Has anybody got any declarations? No. I'm going to make a declaration for agenda item 19. Um, and the chair will be taken by Councillor Fisher at that particular point. Um, moving on to agenda item two, um, that's employee appeal sub on pages seven and eight. They are here for noting. Are you happy to um, agree to the recommendations? Okay, thank you for that. Agenda item uh, three is the, the normal um, start of a committee. We're getting an update um, from appropriate officer on the committee for COVID-19. It covers on page 9 to 12. And I'm going to ask um, Elaine, Elaine Kemp, are you available? I can't see you on the screen, but are you available? I'm, I'm here, convener. All right, I see you now. OK, on you go. <laughs> so this is a, a really positive report, which highlights financial solutions role in supporting the response phase and specifically what we did in relation to supporting vulnerable residents, businesses and other services, and most importantly, what we've done and continue to do to ensure the Council's ongoing financial sustainability. In the immediate response phase, staff were supported to working from home within two weeks, that the majority of staff, and, and a major exercise was undertaken within the service to redeploy staff to ensure there was resilience in, in key areas such as the Scottish Welfare Fund. The report highlights the work, the considerable work undertaken within the Revenues and Benefits team, and, and they worked very closely with our colleagues in enterprise and communities to deliver the Small Business Grant Support Scheme. We made in total 3,900 awards to local businesses, totalling in excess of 41 million. At, at the same time, the Revenues team managed a significant increase in workload through uh, uh, seeing an increase in applications for council tax reduction and through the welfare fund. Council tax recovery action was stood down for the period from April to June and staff were diverted to assist in business support grants at that time. In line with other councils processes, recovery was stood back up again with the issue of soft reminders to those in arrears at the end of July. And we encouraged those in arrears to get in touch to agree payment arrangements and to signpost them in, in, to the financial inclusion team for further advice and assistance if required. More formal collection arrangements have now been established with statutory reminders issued at the beginning of this month. The remainder of the report goes on to focus on the work undertaken within the financial solutions side of the team to ensure that deadlines were achieved and ensure the ongoing financial sustainability of the Council. Um, I'm, I'm happy to take comments on the report. Thank you. Okay, Elaine, um, I'd asked everybody to use the, the chat bar. We're on agenda item three. Um, I don't see anybody has come in um, to, to ask a question uh, on that. Um, members, um, can you agree the recommendations? Yeah. Good. Thank you. Moving forward to agenda item uh, four on pages 13 to 22. Um, it's coming from uh, Fiona Whittaker. Fiona. Thanks, convener. So uh, this paper outlines progress in an ongoing programme of work to improve the Council's digital and online learning offering, LearnNL. Members will be aware that the committee approved the migration of our previous digital learning provision to a new cloud-based platform, Tratara. 
This platform offers significantly enhanced capabilities and a much wider audience reach than the previous platform which we had in place. The details of that platform and the progress that we've made in rolling that out um, are set out in section 2.1. Um, and there are also some screen captures of what the new system actually looks like in Appendix 2. The rest of the report focuses, more importantly, on what we've now begun to deploy in terms of the enhanced functionality that that system actually now offer us, uh, offers the Council. Um, and that is to support the development of some pretty key digital learning provisions. So I'm only going to highlight a couple of the provisions that I think are most important within the rest of the report. Um, and I'm obviously happy to take questions on the others at the end. So the two that I would like to highlight, uh, firstly, is set out in section 2.2.3, which outlines recent work we've undertaken within the Education and Family Service on their Innovation and Improvement Hub. This hub will better support the statutory requirements the Council has for continuous professional development for teachers and also the reporting or the accurate reporting of that to Education Scotland. Uh, and the screenshots of uh, that provision are shown in Appendix 3. Section 2.2.5 is the second item that I'd like to highlight, where we've been able to fully leverage the platform during the current COVID, COVID pandemic, in particular to offer support to staff and managers to assist with some of the more challenging aspects of mental health support and also the difficulties that have been presented to both staff and managers in terms of homeworking. Finally, I just want to uh, highlight in section 2.3 that the new platform will play a critical role in supporting the digital NL programme both now and going forward. Uh, and that includes the most recent rollout of the Microsoft 365 platform uh, and in addition supporting the upskilling of staff as they transition into some of the more um, complicated digital roles that are going to uh, be part of our customer services and business intelligence hubs. So I'll stop there and I'm very happy to take any questions on any of the content. Thank you, Fiona. I've um, got a question from uh, Councillor uh, Jordan, Jordan London. Um, thanks very much, Convener. Thanks very much. Well, you may have touched on this at section 2.1.4 of the report, um, but I was wondering what work is ongoing, if any, to uh, actively engage staff in the development process to understand um, I guess needs and demands, um, I, I, and perhaps using them as a kind of key testing point to understand, um, uh, you know, what they would find most useful from the development of the platform as you move forward. I know you've mentioned the participants in the pilot uh, groups, but um, you know, right across portfolio, um, what work is ongoing to engage them in the development of, of it to ensure that it meets their needs. So thanks for that question, Councillor Linden. Uh, that's very much part of all the work we do. We always will go out and do a training needs analysis, and that does include users uh, and beneficiaries of that work. So if it's if it's not fully represented in this report, I apologise, but that's very much part of our approach and methodology uh, in terms of any of this work as we develop it. I think we maybe touch on some of that in the next report, uh, Jordan. Um, uh, may well be with that. I've got another um, Councillor Morgan. Thanks, Convener. Convener, I maybe develops in that point that Councillor Linden raised there. Um, one thing that COVID has done is it's clarified the urgency that we need in developing the d digital skills for the workforce. Many services would not have been risen to the challenge. In the report, and I know COVID doesn't come at a good time, so I'm well aware of the pressures that are on the department regarding training generally. But it's that digital skills development. I'm a bit disappointed to see the figure that's mentioned on page 17. At the very end, the financial impact, there's a there's a reference there that we will use as much funding from Scottish Government's Flexible Workforce Development Fund and the Skills Development Scotland to train our workforce. Now, I'm well aware of the stretches of time and effort on everybody in the Council are now. But all I see referred to there that we have managed to achieve to put into that particular pot for skills development is 15,000. I mean, am I reading that right? Is that all that we've managed to actually acquire to transfer over to the skills development of our workforce? Is that all that was on offer? Because that works out at a rough estimate, convener. 
15,000 employees a pound ahead. That's never going to meet the needs, the skills development that we have for everybody, all the way from those in low-skilled jobs, manual jobs, all the way through to the top. Hopefully I'm reading it wrong, but if it's the case that we need to go put the begging bowl out, don't see any money referred to there that's coming from Skills Development Scotland. Are these areas that we've still to actually, doors that we've still to chart, or have we chart doors and been told no? Because we can't accept that. Okay. Thanks, Thanks, Councillor Morgan. Fiona? So, Councillor Morgan, I think you're outlining a, a, a source of frustration that is in place across the whole local authorities about the hope that that provision would be extended. So, I can absolutely confirm the 15th and is all that's on offer at the moment, and that's drawn from the levy funding that we as a council um, provide to the Scottish Government on an annual basis. Um, what, I, what I can say is that the priority for that funding has been um, very much put on the support of the graduate and the foundation and modern apprenticeship. So less has been uh, focused towards those more flexible skills funds at the moment. We continue to lobby both Skills Development Scotland and the Scottish Government to, to try and balance that. Um, and I think going forward, that is a consideration they're going to have to make to support what's ahead of us in terms of the impact on the labour market. But I can confirm at this point in time that 15,000 is all that's on offer to all organisations and it's a flat rate, uh, irrespective of how much you put in uh, in terms of your levy fund. Councillor Morgan, I had spoke to Fiona about this, about yeah. that, and um, you would expect me to, to do that. And Absolutely. The, the, lobby, the lobby will, will, will continue. That's why the 15,000 was specifically targeted, because you used an example a pound ahead. You know, um, I, I know what you're saying, but it's been specifically targeted specifically at this moment. Councillor Morgan, we are where we are right now, but I appreciate the point in raising that. Councillor Hume. Right, thank, thanks, Chair. And this is for information. It was prompted by. You know, sorry, sorry, Jim. Can was, you get okay? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Jim. It was prompted by uh, item 224 on page 16. Um, and it, it mentioned uh, uh, a couple of uh, processes, um, toolkits. Uh, and and, and my, my question was going to be has that been amended to accommodate um, the. Uh, COVID-19 situation, but 225 clarifies that and says yeah. um, amendments have been made. But what my, my question is, uh, every I, I suspect almost every policy in the Council will be impacted um, by COVID-19. So what, what I'm wondering is, is that how, how are these policies being amended to accommodate um, changes caused by 19, either to uh, the way we deliver services or internal working practices? Um, uh, because, you know, I, I suspect perhaps even ongoing, all the policies only change. So how is it being accommodated just now and how is it being recorded for future and um, anything that happens in the future? Fiona, have you got anything on that before I make a comment? Yeah, so I have made no fundamental changes to our policies because uh, any changes would require to come back to you as a committee for approval. But what we've done is we've drawn from existing policies and created an interim homeworking scheme that allows us to uh, enhance those policies in ways that supports our employees. So that homeworking scheme has recently been launched. Um, and if after about six months time, and we will we'll take feedback from employees, as you can see, in terms of surveys, we believe that requires to be a permanent arrangement and we need to make permanent changes to those policies. We, we will, Councillor Hume, have to update those policies and bring them back to yourselves for approval. Can I say, Councillor Hume, as well, I think you were a bit wider in your type of question, not just about this finance and resources. I think that's where you were going. And I think it's clear. Um, I said at the start of the, the meeting, we're six months into it. As we go through, and we don't, we've got no idea how long this is going to last. It may well be that we all need to look at the policies that are there and review them, but they need to come back to us, Jim. So that's why, that's why Fiona was saying it that way. Listen, um, agenda item four, I've got no other speaker's request. So can we, can we uh, agree at, at item four? Yes. Item five on page 2336 um, is a follow-up to the previous report um, from HR. It's a positive report. 
Um, so I'll ask uh, Fiona to say a few words on it. Thank you, Fiona. Okay, thank you, convener. And apologies, there's there's probably a little bit of overlap with the previous paper, um, yeah. but this paper in particular focuses on um, an update to elected members about wider progress on the employee and well-being provision, particularly against the five priorities which are set out in section two point one. I'm conscious it's it's a lengthy paper and there's lots of detail and we have many agenda items today, so I don't propose to go into any significant detail um, on the good progress that, that we have made. But again, I just want to highlight a couple of things. So priority number four in section 2.5 and the particular support which has been available through our NL Life provision to help our staff save money and manage their finances during the COVID crisis. And also the work we've delivered under priority number five in section 2.6, where we've detailed all of the work which has been undertaken to support our staff and managers, particularly with mental health and resilience during the COVID pandemic. In particular, I wanted to highlight the All of Us psychological support provision, which is set out in six, section 2.6.8. This has been developed jointly with NHS Lanarkshire uh, and it gives specific mental health support to our health and social care teams and particular home care and adult social care. Um, I don't particularly want to highlight anything uh, additional in the report, but again, I'm happy to take questions on any of the content. Okay, Fiona um, said that it was a positive report um, and I don't see any um, questions in the chat bar. So the recommendations are on page 23. Are you happy to agree the recommendations? Councillor Hume's just come in for a question. Sorry, Jim, I missed you. On you go. Sorry, you go, I, was wait, I was waiting to fill in a finish there. Um, I, 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 I um, some quite significant concerns, um, both in my own part and from speaking to staff about um, the, the, the position of our computer as we went in without them having to work. And um, I have to say, um, both this paper and other papers, um, the council seems to be taking it uh, really seriously. Um, so I, I, I appreciate that on behalf of the staff. Uh, I think I think there'll be lots of lots of hidden issues there that the staff um, may not want to discuss. So I, I, I think uh, I think giving them the as much opportunity as possible to do that, uh, and indeed to accommodate any any. Um, Concerns they have is, is, is very worthwhile, and the council seems to be doing that. Um, I know on page uh, twenty-four and one point three, there's a, there's a survey being being um, taken place, well, and, and there's been other other discussions um, in the report as well with with staff uh, asking for feedback. Will, will councillors be aware of the responses to these initiatives? Fiona. Yeah, that's certainly, I have that data. That's certainly something I'm more than happy to share. Um, and also just to emphasise that we'll be continuing those surveys, uh, you know, small small group surveys and large surveys over the next six months. So to answer your question, I'm more than happy to share that information if it's required. Okay. Um, I think um, uh, maybe just to say, given Jim's comments, or Jim Hume's, Councillor Hume's comments, um, I think it's right that um, over the, the last six months there's been a substantial shift of work, work patterns with staff and that in itself can bring a lot of pressures and we all know that. Um, and I think the important thing is to make sure that we look after our staff and, and go ahead in a positive manner. And I hope and agree that we will all do that. I don't have any other questions um, for agenda item five. Um, so can we agree the recommendations on page 23? Yeah, thank you. Moving on to um, agenda item six, it's on page 37 and it's pages 37 to 40 and it's uh, the annual accounts, the eight term. Um, it's Elaine Kemp. Elaine. Thank you. This report provides committee with the key highlights from the annual accounts. Both the general funds and the housing revenue accounts returned surpluses, probably in line with what was reported through the year in budget monitoring reports. The final surplus on the general fund was confirmed at 4.029 million and on the HRA 2.581 million. 
the, the paper highlights a cumulative general fund surplus of 48.401 million, and it shows you that has been earmarked at the end of the financial year for future use. That you'll see that the unallocated or contingency element of the reserve remains at 8 million, representing around 1% of the overall expenditure budget. The report also advises that the accounts were produced and submitted to Audit Scotland by the 30th of June, which is our normal time scale. The Coronavirus Scotland Act did give our authorities flexibility in the deadline to submit unaudited accounts, but ours were, I'm happy to say, submitted by the statutory deadline, demonstrating continued effective financial management, particularly in light of the coronavirus pandemic. And, and this was a real achievement, given that it was done wholly remotely by my teams. The unaudited accounts have been presented to the Audit and Scrutiny Panel on the 3rd of September, when Audit Scotland commented positively on our ability to achieve that deadline. The audit process is now nearing an end, and the fully audited accounts will be presented to the panel at a special meeting in October. I've had the final clearance meeting with the auditors, and I expect there to be no issues arising from the audit process. Thank you, Elaine. Um, is there any questions? I don't see any in the, the chat bar, but I think that um, uh, I should say that um, a big uh, thank you, Elaine, should be passed back to your staff because genuinely um, you could have had an extension to that period and you got it in time. And as you said, it's been filtered through the scrutiny panel and uh, Audit Scotland um, made a, a, a good um, comment on it. So there's, no, there's nothing in the, the chat bar, uh, colleagues. So the recommendations is on page 37. Are you happy to agree with them? Yes? Agreed. Okay. Agreed. Thank you. Moving on to agenda item um, seven. Um, this is the Treasury Management Annual Activity Report, and this is for 1920. Um, you'll know this is, um, I've said in the past, a technical report. Um, it's pages um, 41 to 64. Um, I'll pass you back again to Elaine. Elaine Kemp. Thank you. The, the annual report, the, this is the annual report which provides information on the Treasury management activity over the, the previous financial year and its impact on borrowing and investment. It also provides information on performance against the targets which have been set. It's a requirement under the SIPFA Code of Practice on Treasury Management and the SIPFA Prudential Code for Capital Finance and Local Authorities. So, uh, as the convener said, the, the report comes to this committee for noting. And I, I don't normally go through the detail of it with committee, as it is a, a fairly technical report. What, what we do, however, is um, always uh, give the, 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 the offer to all elected members that were happy to speak directly to me or with Joe Quinn, the Treasury Management Treasury Manager, apologies, out with this meeting if they have any questions or if you want to know more about activity in Treasury Management section generally. You'll know, colleagues, um, that uh, there's an item later in the agenda, which is a quarterly report of the Treasury Management. Um, this is the roundup of the year for the annual report. Uh, I don't see any questions in the chat bar. Uh, recommendations are on page 41. Are you happy to agree them? Yes, I'm getting the nod. OK. Moving on to um, uh, agenda item 8 on pages 65 to 70. Um, again, uh, it's a payment of local taxation and benefit update. Um, back to you, Elaine. Okay. The, the, now, this report highlights the performance on council tax and non-domestic rates. The income levels on both are down due to COVID-19. Uh, as, as I've already mentioned earlier, the, the recovery of council tax debt was stood down following the lockdown, but it's now been reinstated. Soft reminders were issued, but we've now moved to more formal uh, recovery arrangements. The, the, the soft reminders process was largely successful, and we have seen an increase in income following this action. 
Um, we've seen a sharp increase in council tax reduction claims up significantly on, on last year, but I, I would note that Scottish Government have provided additional funding for councils to manage the increase in payments to those that are now eligible. The Scottish Welfare Fund, additional funding has been provided by Scottish Government and that's allowed the priority level on the fund to be reduced from high to medium, which is great news, means that we can now support more claims through the fund. We do, however, expect additional pressure on the fund through crisis grants, particularly as furlough comes to an end, depending on, on what may or may not be now put in place to replace this, the, the coronavirus job retention scheme. There may be more movement also on community care grants to be expected as some lockdown restrictions were eased and people began to move house again, although that position may well change again. So in summary, that there is a risk around the Scottish Welfare Fund, but the additional funding from Scottish Government has been welcomed and will allow us, should allow us to contain expenditure within the funding provided. So th those are the key highlights from that report, and I'm happy to take questions on, on any of the content. Thank you, um, uh, Elaine. I think the point Elaine makes about the Scottish Welfare Fund is important. Um, whilst it's sitting there, um, we anticipate there's going to be a, a run on it. Um, we've set the level, as Elaine has said, at, at medium, which allows more people to get access to that. Um, and that's something we will be monitoring very clearly. Um, I've got Councillor Ashraf. Uh, thank you, Convener. Yeah, uh, sorry, the computer's been a bit slow. No, um, it's, it's okay. <laughs> I just had a, a question in relation to also the uh, first key point to note, saying that 36.5% um, of council tax for 2020-2021 had been collected, uh, and it's a 1% reduction from the same point from last year. Um, Considering so, this is like the halfway point. So when they say thirty six point five percent, so the expectation would be that fifty percent of the entirety of the year would have been collected. So uh, in relation to how much that is as a percentage of the entirety of how much we should have collected, is that um, forty percent? So there's a twenty percent reduction in terms of what should have been collected. So we would expect fifty percent instead of. Basically, what I'm saying is thirty six point five percent is fifty percent. Um, what would be 100% of the collection rate if it was till the half year point? Is that the point that's being made there? Um, as opposed to only 36.5% being collected of the entirety of the 100%, if that made sense. Really. Um, right, ju just to be clear, the, this report um, is reporting on the period only up to the 31st of July. Uh, so it's only the first quarter of the year yeah. and, and and what the, the generally over the year you'll be aware we collect around 96 percent of, of of council tax however at this point in the year based on previous year's trends we would normally have collected 37.5 percent but this year it's down by one percent and at that point as at the 31st of july we've only collected 36.5 percent of the annual total does that make that a bit clearer? Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, I had a number of other questions related to this, but I'll send it to you in an email uh, if that works better for you. Right. Um, have you got more questions? Today? No? Are you okay? No, no, I'll be good. Okay, right. I don't see any other questions for agenda item uh, eight. The recommendations is on page 65. Are you happy to agree? Yeah, okay. Agenda item nine is the this is the first of a, a number of um, general debt write offs. Um, uh, I'll let Elaine um, speak briefly on this one. Elaine, item nine. Okay, very, very briefly. Again, very standard, briefly. Yep. this is a standard annual report which highlights the outstanding debtor accounts which have been deemed to be uncollectible following all, all attempts at recovery or which are not economically viable to pursue. Um, for context, uh, just to add a wee bit to the report, the, the total value of debts to be written off is down on last year and, and the report shows that in, on in, in the table on section 2.1. Um, 
happy to take questions, but it's a fairly standard report which shows an, in, an improved trend, if you like, on last year's position. Members, you've been here and um, seen the, the normal layout of this, and as I said, there are four uh, reports. Councillor Morgan, you want a comment? Question? A question really, convener. I think it'd be probably in everybody's mind. The financial impact of this uh, refers to the financial year of 2018-19. Um, we don't. We're not all Mystic Meg. We don't have the crystal ball. But what is the situation that we've allowed for in bad debt? I'm not just talking about this report. I'm talking about the plethora. I'm talking about the council's policy towards bad debt, which I think would be reasonable to assume that this is going to. Uh, accelerate or it's going to multiply. So has there been an this is from two years ago if I'm reading it correctly, Elaine. Have we actually increased it for next year? Because next year will be the financial year where we're in this situation, looking at this year's finances and what is the department doing to address what inevitably I think it's reasonable to assume is going to be a multiplication or an acceleration in these problem areas. Tom, can I say to you, um, before Elaine comes back, um, the 2018-19 is on the table in 2.1 that I think you're making reference to. The figure here is for the year right off 2019-20. And I think what it shows is um, a, a drop on the amount of debt right off. But you've got a, a, a wider question than that. No, no. Can I just clarify, Chair? I've read the report right because I've read it yep. two or three times. Can I just yep. refer you then? I know there's two charts there. Well, what it says at 4 1, the financial impact, what we're been asked to do here is use 2019 20 figures to write off the accounts for 2018 19. That says that at 4 1. If that's correct, what have we done for successive years or succeeding years, and how are we addressing forthcoming years? I know there's okay. two charts there, but we have to look retrospectively back the way. Okay, I get what you're saying, Councillor Morgan. Elaine? So, so the debt that's been written off in this report does relate to the financial year 1920, and and the figures that are there for 1819 are purely for comparison purposes, so that you can you can see the the trend. However, I, I take your point, Councillor Morgan. How are we going to then use that information to project into how bad debts may look in the future? And it is something that my team are, are, are very, very conscious of and starting to have a look at. It's so difficult at this point in time to predict what the impact of the, the pandemic will be, particularly on, on um, debt recovery, if you like. Our position will always be to pursue debt. As, as best we possibly can, because every penny is essential to council services, as you well know. But we will need to take a pragmatic approach to looking at whether there is a requirement to increase the bad debt provision. At the end, and that will be under consideration. So when we write debt off, we generally don't see a financial impact, and that's what yeah. you've picked up on because we've made a provision for that. Yeah. So what we'll be doing through this year is reassessing the provision in light of developments. Okay. That's um, grand. Thanks for that, convener. That clarifies the position that we're aware of it. Okay. Um, Councillor Burgess, I think I've got you one, two, three times on the chat bar. I don't know whether you've um, stuck your finger on it or whatever, or did you come in? Uh, oh, and you come. And you come, Bob. That's me. It's all over the place. Sorry, right. is that off again? No, you've got, we've got you. You've got me okay. Yeah, yeah we've got I've, you. I've, my screen's all over the place, so I'm pressing buttons everywhere. Um, I just have a question for Elaine. Now, do we have any uh, areas for protection of debts, uh, Elaine? Um, I know sometimes it's only if you're looking at maybe creating a big debt, but um, do we have any protection at all, or is there any? Elaine? In, Councillor Burgess, do you refer to insurance protection or, or these sort of arrangements? If, if, if so, then no. What, what we do is, as I've explained in response to Councillor, uh, the, pre the previous question, um, we, we, Councillor Morgan, apologies, we set up a bad debt provision and that's that's the means by which we, we manage our debt. We always assume, based on uh, emerging information, that there will be a level of debt that's not collectible. 
and we keep that as up to date and under review. But we have no actual insurance ag against that, if, if that's your question. Yeah, that, that's more or less yes, uh, and I appreciate that. Thank you, Elian. Okay, Councillor Ashraf. Is it there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. you can. Um, I just had a question in, in relation to obviously the, uh, the two categories of being less than five hundred pound and being over five hundred pound for uh, the you know the bad debt collection. I mean, is there any level of uh, is there any extra information on the above five hundred pound? Because uh, I mean that's a quite a large range because it's about one hundred seventy seven thousand pound. I mean, is there any specific um, extra analysis that could be provided? I mean, over five hundred pound could be a thousand pound or it could be you know, fifty-five thousand pound being written off from one person. I mean, is there any level of that sort of analysis available to the committee for the councillors to see? I, I don't have it to hand at the moment, uh, but it can be provided if if that's what committee requests. Yes, I can provide a, a full breakdown of that. Um, Jenny, it's not um, um, a, a usual question for that because they group all the amount together. But um, if you are you are you seeking a breakdown of that? Yeah, if you could, and if you could see C and um, yeah, Councillor Hume as well, uh, that'd be great. Okay, thank you. We'll okay, not a problem, we'll do that. I don't see any other um, questions on the chat bar for agenda item uh, nine. Can we agree the recommendation? Yes. Item 10 is um, uh, uh, a remit um, for annual debt from education and families. It's here for uh, approval for the committee. Are you happy to agree that on page 75? Indeed. Yep. Same applies from housing and regeneration on pages 79 to 82. It's been um, passed to here for a remit for ourselves. Are you happy to agree the recommendations? Indeed. Indeed. Item 12 is um, similar for the Sunday debt write off on pages 83 to 86. Again, colleagues, are you happy to agree the recommendations? Great. Great. Um, item 13 is um, a procurement strategy. It's on pages 87 to 112. It's quite a lengthy uh, document. It's a procurement strategy for 20 to 22. Um, James McKinstry, where are you? You're at the bottom now. OK. And you can. Thank you, convener. Uh, I'm aware that the first procurement strategy for North Lanarkshire Council was presented to the Policy uh, and Resources Committee in September 2017. And what we do is we carry out a review of that strategy on an annual basis. And you'll see in paragraph 1.1 of the report that, that we, we, we spend approximately £450 million uh, procuring services and contracts on an annual basis. So it's important. The council does have a strategy in, in place, and then that 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 the importance of that is, a, for example, it, it 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 helps us to ensure that we'll get an efficient and effective a, procurement service. And importantly, it helps us to achieve best value and, sh and ensure that quality contracts, quality services, quality advice that's procured by the by the council a, is something that we get. And most importantly. Uh, it's extremely important to ensure that procurement activity is done in a lawful and ethical manner. manner. And it's important that as we move forward uh, and we, we take into account that we've got more, we've got some very significant procurements that will be coming forward uh, in the future, some of it in the near future, linked into the ambition and the plan for North Lanarkshire. And I'm thinking, for example, the continued uh, work in digital NL, the new house build programmes we, 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 we do, the school build programmes that we do, and indeed, the work that we're doing on the the enterprise uh, project, for example, to ensure that, that we have robust uh, procurement practices in in place. In paragraph two point two of the report that that provides some details of the benefits that we can achieve through a uh, good procurement activity. This could include, for example, uh, contributing to making budget savings. And over the last two uh, pre uh, financial years, we contributed the best part of one million pounds. To, 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 to revenue savings, and we've also delivered some uh, efficiencies in capital projects as well. We strive wherever we can to make sure that we can uh, do procurement with local businesses, and we strive wherever we can as well to make sure that we can get uh, good community benefits, such as employment and training opportunities, environmental benefits, and ensuring sustained 
uh, uh, and safe working practices. If I can refer you to paragraph 2.8 of the report, which is in part, uh, page 89 of the report, you'll see in there as well, we refer to the PSIP assessment, which was reported to this committee uh, late last year, and where we moved into the top quartile of a, a, a procurement a, a, in, in, in Scotland in the local public sector. And I think that was quite an important step for us to make. And we improved in all indicators, particularly in leadership and governance. That leadership and governance applies to the political process as well as the, 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 uh, the, the officer process. And uh, paragraph 2.9 advises we, can, we will continue to keep this strategy under review. And if there's any changes that need to be done, uh, we, will, we will carry them out and we'll bring them to committee uh, for approval. I think just in kind of concluding before you know, ask you to consider recommendations, it's, it is an important time in procurement at the moment. There is, there is, there is a number of significant events going on at the present time that, 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 that to some extent create a bit of uncertainty in the procurement environment. Clearly, the, the COVID situation and the, the ongoing impact of the COVID situation is, is, is probably top of our list at the moment as well. But also Brexit, which will be happening uh, you know, very soon, is something that will impact on, on our procurement strategy going forward as well. So we will be carrying out a review of, of, of that. And also, uh, I think we also need to look at things like the general contract standing orders, particularly in relation to, to, to Brexit. So just in, in, in finishing, uh, just asking the committee to note the contents and approve the strategy for uh, what would be this, this, this financial year and through to the end of a uh, next financial year. Okay. Um, there are some councillors in the chat bar. Uh, Councillor Larson, followed by Councillor Lyndon Jordan. Councillor Larson, um, I see that you've come in three times on it. Has that just been a wee hiccup? It's just been a wee hiccup with the computer. Thank you. Yeah, yeah we've yeah. all got them. We've all got them. But just to make <laughs> sure, um, Andrew and I, as you know, are monitoring it, but just to make sure with it. So, and you come. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Um, I, I welcomed when you introduced the report there that you, you did give some kind of discussion of, of um, more localised procurement, um, uh, and that's something that's been discussed at a national kind of level just now. Certainly, we've seen a lot of chat about um, how we could assist local economies um, through procurement coming through the LGUI um, briefings and what have you. So I suppose I'm asking, to what extent do you think you're likely to change your procurement processes for things that are already maybe up and running, like the new house builds and all the rest of it? Uh, do you think we can really make a difference to local businesses by adapting to more localised procurement? Uh, I know in Brexit, um, do we have any indication yet of how um, Brexit itself is going to impact us in relation to procurement? That's me. Can I say before James comes in, uh, see the last part you're saying there about Brexit? I think we all know, don't we? <laughs> we don't know what's going to happen um, uh, with it, but that's only me making a wee comment. James, in you come. Right, thank you. I think there was two points uh, made there, Councillor Larson. In terms of uh, procurement activity and procurement activity going forward and how, how we, we can uh, promote that with the wider wa ma marketplace and also local marketplace, that, that, that to some extent will be covered uh, maybe in the next item, which, 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 I'm on, which I'm coming on to the procurement plan, which details what we would think is likely procurement go going forward. Uh, clearly, in, you, you know, this year, where we are this year, there, 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 there's more uncertainty with that than there has been in, in, in previous years. But you'll see in that plan what we're doing is we, we are out. Uh, I, I won't say too much because we'll talk about it in the next one. But we are we are going out there. We are promoting what we're, what we're doing. Uh, prior to the to, to, to the lockdown, um, we would also take part in national events and local events as well to try to just encourage get get if you like get North Lanarkshire no, notice. This is the types of work that would be coming forward, etc. As well, we through both on our own and through a big. Uh, procurements. I'm, I'm thinking here, for example, in terms of uh, the new school builds. For example, we work with the we work with the contracting companies and that uh, to, to to run workshops for local companies, etc., to see how they can they can get themselves in a position to subcontract uh, to that. Uh, clearly, though, any procurement activity will always be dependent on you know the best tender coming in, etc., as well type of thing. But we do everything that we can to make sure that that, that local providers uh, 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 get an opportunity uh, to, to to bid and, and hopefully be be successful in relation to to Brexit and such like, etc. 
we were look we were monitoring that situation very closely before the lockdown. We're still doing that. Uh, it would be fair to say that the procurement activity took a, a, a significant change in direction during during the lockdown in terms of things we had to do. I mean, there was reference earlier on to policies, etc. We had to review our own policies in line with, with advice that was coming out from the Scottish Government, etc. We had to prioritise our procurement activity, particularly into the into the, the, the social uh, work settings uh, for PPE equipment, etc., whatever type of thing. Uh, but but we are when I say we're back working to normal. What I mean is is we, we you know uh, we we are starting again, looking to see how we can try to get ahead of the curve when 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 Brexit is is it, it comes around. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily going to change our, our procuring activity so much. It might be about how we do procurement that 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 that. that uh, that, that we'll have to look at, but I would intend that that, that, that next calendar year we would be bringing uh, a report to this committee, either this committee of policy and resources. I'm not sure which one, uh, with a, a review of the general ca contract standing orders, because I think I think that would be required at that time. Okay, Councillor Linden. Thanks, convener. Um, I welcome the report, uh, James, and thanks for sharing it with us. Particularly welcoming the improved position in 2019 from 2017 in relation to the PCIP assessment. Um, on that then, whilst recognising what's been said at section 2.6 of the report in terms of the broad principles of the 2017 strategy standing at now, um, I guess the question and the obvious question is how is the new strategy strengthened uh, to realise further improvement in the PCIP assessment in terms of it being a measure of success? And building on um, what's been stated in 2017 to ensure we continue to see that success improve. I think I think in answer to that question, I would probably you know look retrospectively first of all, you, you know, and, and and just want to say something about the PSIP assessment. Will be moved from from the fourth quartile to the to the to the top a, a, a quartile. There's ten indicators. Uh, in, in that assessment, uh, the indicator which we, we improved in them all, the indicator which which uh, we we improved the most was in leadership and governance, and and and, and that with that as I said earlier, you know, just in my my, my verbal uh, introduction to the report, that wasn't just officer. Uh, leadership and governance. That was also the political leadership and governance. And what what was what was certainly noticed, and, and I believe I need to go back and check, commented on in the piece of assessment is the fact that we were taking the strategies and our plans to 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 committee. We were getting them out there into the to to, to the local workplace, uh, the local uh, uh, environment. Sorry, the national environment, etc. As well. So we have a procurement improvement plan as well, uh, which which we monitor. Uh, I have to be honest with you and say that since the the, the lockdown, uh, all our procurement staff have been working exceptionally hard to, to support services, uh, and it's only recently that we've, we've picked up again having a re review our procurement and, and, and improvement plan. Uh, that, that that doesn't overly concern me, if I'm being honest with you. I think the I think the area one of the areas that we needed to, we need to improve is uh, e procurement. And we are working on that at the moment, and to, to some extent, the, the most recent circumstances are, are, are contributing to that. But we want to go better on that as well. We 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 are not due to get another piece of assessment for about a, a time. The earliest we'd have got one would have been 2021, the, because we got a, a decent one the last time. I think it might have even been a bit later. Uh, even Scotland Excel, who carry out these the, these procurement assessments, their whole work program will have been affected so much in terms of you know. I still meet with the. The, the chief executive of Scotland XL on a quarterly basis in terms of you know but but most of those discussions at the moment are are on kind of responding to to uh, the lockdown and and and, and uh, the limitations that we've got etc. We we spent a lot of time over the summer uh, working how we could support the, the return of the construction industry and also support construction industries as as they were in their lockdown at the present time as well. And one of the things that we're going to be, be looking at in the very near future will be, I suspect, we'll, we'll, we'll start to get contractor claims coming in for time delays, etc., whatever type of thing. And contracts have been signed off, but because there's been a, such a, a devastating impact on the subcontractor industry, a plaster work, brick work, etc., whatever thing, and we're going to have to look at all that. So a, a, I'm not saying we're going to put all our improvement activity Aside, but but a priority at the moment has to has to be about uh, managing the situation uh, that, that, that 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 we're in. But but without being in a position of having an assessment, I'm I'm fairly comfortable that as the head of service in this area that that, that we are still uh, carrying out things 
uh, to a very very high standard. And you know, if we were to be assessed just now, I think we would get we would get an improved score at the, pre the present time. But that's just me, you know, if you like, uh, putting my opinion forward. But <laughs> one self evaluation of the procurement activity, and it's not only the procurement te team, the procurement. Uh, the commercial improvement assessment. That's about procurement across all of the council. So it's, it's a, you know that's me doing a, a very quick self evaluation, if you like, of all the procurement activity that's going across and all the services. I think um, thank you, James, for that. That's a, a comprehensive response to to Councillor London. Um, just to say that um, we've came. It's been a long journey um, for the team, the procurement team, and I think the, the statistics show us we're heading in the right direction. But to get to in a better place, but to stay in a better place is even harder than getting there in the first place. And that's the important part. And that's what this procurement strategy is all about. Brexit will no doubt make um, forced changes to where we go, but we will deal with that as and, as and when and that happens. Listen, um, there's no other councillors uh, on the chat bar. Um, I'm looking for your recommendation agreement on page 87. Are you happy to agree that? Yeah. Indeed. OK, thank you. Um, Item 14 is another uh, procurement report for 2019. It's the annual report. I'm going to take us back to, to, to James. Thank you, convener, as well as just, uh, providing a, 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 an update on the strategy to committee. And this is a requirement uh, that we provide a, a report on, on procurement activity uh, to council uh, to council committee on an annual basis. And what, what this report does, it, it provides details of the, the procurement activity for last financial year, uh, provides details against their objectives in a, in a previous uh, strategy. And importantly, uh, it also provides details of a forward plan for procurement activity uh, going forward, which which is which is extremely important in the times that the times that we're in. There's, there's risks with doing that forward plan, but we've also got to make sure that the market is aware that North Lanarkshire Council is still going to be procure things, and that kind of can give the marketplace a, a, a bit of security going forward. Number of appendices. I won't go through the appendices. Appendix one that details all the regula regulated procurement activity for last year. Appendix two gives details of the performance indicator against these regulated uh, uh, procurement activity. Appendix three gives wider performance indicators, so that will talk about fee set rating, for example, budget savings, and so on. Appendix four that provides details of uh, some of the, the community benefits, and importantly, appendix five that's the forward plan that I referred to in my introduction there and I referred in. My previous response to Councillor Larson. So, so the recommendations are on page one 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 thirteen, asking you to note the contents of the report and also to you note note that this report is published on the Council's website and it's also a report that's issued to Scottish ministers and they collate all these procurement plans for all the thirty two local authorities and they, they, they publish a national plan and that, that contributes to the point I was uh, making when I was responding to Councillor Larson about making sure that that that, uh, that the people are aware of the procurements that are happening in the in the, the public uh, sector going forward. Colleagues, there's um, a lot of detail there, especially in the uh, appendices. Um, um, I, I have urged you in the past that um, see any time once you get your paperwork, if you've got any questions that you would like to ask the officers. Um, you can do that at any time. You don't have to come to a meeting like this, and that's important as we move forward. Um, but um, it's a very comprehensive report, and it's a, a good report. I don't see uh, any names in the chat bar. So on page 113, can I ask you to agree the recommendations? Agreed? OK, thank you. Moving on to agenda item 15. This is the quarterly management report for... Treasury management um, uh, and it's uh, Elaine. Um, again, I've said before in the past it's a very technical report. Elaine, can you can you speak briefly to the report? Yep, yep. This uh, first of the budget monitoring reports on on this committee's agenda today, and and the things that I would highlight from this are that during the period of the report and to reflect where we were in the response phase to COVID. The decision was taken to increase the level of funds held on immediate access or held in cash, if you like, from 3 million, which is our normal position, to 20 million for a period during the lockdown. And, and that was to ensure that um, the Council's cash flow position was protected. 
Um, you can imagine there were significant amounts of money going out the door, and particularly immediately following the opening of the business grant support schemes, and increasing, increasing the cash available at that time made sure that there were always sufficient instant balances to pay our normal commitments, such as creditors and payroll. The, the other main impact of the pandemic on Treasury management is that borrowing in this year is now due to be, be lower, predicted to be lower than budget. And, that, and that's mainly because capital programmes couldn't progress as planned during the period of the COVID restrictions. So the capital expenditure is expected to be lower than was originally forecast. And, and this is a result a resulted in a saving of, of approximately a million pounds in loan charges in the current year. And that that will be available on a one off basis and has been built in to my calculations to help offset the budget deficit that the council is currently facing. Um, other than that, I'm, I'm happy to take questions. Those are the key highlights. OK, uh, members, um, Elaine has said she'll take um, any questions on agenda item 15. I don't see any in the chat bar, colleagues. Um, on that basis, can we agree the recommendations on page 149? Can I get that agreement? Agreed. OK, thank you very much. Agenda item um, 16A is on page 159 covers the pages 159 to 170. This is the revenue uh, quarterly report only for the chief exec and other corporate services. That comes under our jurisdiction as the Finance and Resource Committee. Elaine? Um, yep. So the first thing to, that I would say is that those of you on, on other committees will have seen by now that the budget monitoring reports to all committees that are generally more complex, this time round and in this financial year than usual because of the impact of COVID, which has been managed on top of what was already a very challenging budget approved in February for 2021. So in, in relation to the Chief Executive Service, a deficit of 514,000 is predicted, and that's entirely due to additional costs as a result of COVID, totaling 584,000. The, the budget also incorporates 2.2 million of savings, which were previously approved by Council. It's currently anticipated that 1.23 of these, or 55%, will be delivered by the end of the financial year. And, and those that won't be achieved are in relation to the, the digital programme, where we're projecting a shortfall of 943,000. And that, that's mainly due to the fact that the, the focus of the digital programme had to shift in order to respond to the impacts of the pandemic. And this has led to a delay in the delivery of planned savings, although it is anticipated that they will be fully in place within the next financial year. Um, C CMT took early action and issued clear instructions to all services to implement mitigating actions in order to address as far as possible the envisaged overall council budget gap for 2021. And we did that by reducing expenditure, non-essential expenditure, and introducing a, a freeze on recruitment. So the Chief Executive Service is estimated to contribute to that. Uh, to the value of 1.35 million, um, and, and that's made up of approximately 800,000 on curtailment of non on, on a recruitment freeze basis, and just over half a million through curtailing non-essential expenditure. The final thing that I, I would highlight is, is the cost of COVID for the service, which is detailed in section 2.5 of the report and, um, and in appendix 6. The, the service expects to incur costs of, of 2.607 million, and there's various reasons for this. It includes increased expenditure through the welfare fund, which we have already highlighted today, although this will be funded by Scottish Government. We will also see a loss of income, particularly through registrars and licensing services, and we will see additional expenditure incurred in administering the business grant scheme and also costs of moving to home working along with some overtime costs incurred, for example, for registrars. Again, happy to take questions, Kandina. 
Okay, thank you for Elaine. Um, it's quite a, a comprehensive report with six appendices on it. I've got Councillor Morgan. Councillor Morgan. Thanks, Convener. Even if I hadn't noticed this one last night, I still think it's relevant to ask it at the committee rather than take it up individually with the department, because I do see it as a strategic question. It's in relation to the actual narrative of the report and the appendices, and there's an area there that I'd seek some clarification on, and it's how we're auditing the funding. I do know that this is a, a quarterly report. It really is a taste of which to come. It's the first quarter of the year. It's the start of COVID. When you then read the report, you've got to sympathise with staff. You've got to look at the additional uh, duties and responsibilities we've got. A couple of things that's come on there uh, that Elaine mentioned, the business grant, so on and so forth. £41 million pounds worth additional working into um, registers and DHP and Scottish Welfare Fund. And we take all that and we're, we're trying to do it. But when I turn to the appendices, there's one area there that gives me cause for concern. And I think it's about right that we get it clear the start of the financial year after the first quarter or address the concerns of God. Page 164, when you zoom in and audit and risk, I'm seeing there that there's a proposed cut in expenditure of auditing. Now, I'm not easily led by what I read in the press or what I see in the media, but there's been a lot of allegations made that that's 41 million we got, 42. The many of these business grants, there's questions about eligibility and so on and so forth, and that's not the only area. That's extra tasks, extra weight on the shoulders of your staff. Is it tenable for us to go forward under the clause of a recruitment freeze to expect our audit team to address the responsibilities there while at the same time be writing in a cut in audit finances? If anything, Chair, those additional resources or those additional tasks will need additional resources. I'd like to Elaine's opinion on that, because I do appreciate it's the first quarter. I think if we don't get it right in the first quarter, the next three parts of this financial year could be problematic in those areas. OK, thanks, Councillor Morgan. Elaine? OK, for first point, Councillor Morgan, I would confirm that there are no planned cuts to the audit service. We recognise that that them that they are absolutely essential and would not be recommending a, a reduction in the resource in, in that team. Um, the, the, the variance that you're seeing at, in, at this stage in the financial year is projected to be 35,000. And, and, and that is due to a part vacancy within Ken's team, which he's been running with for some time. So it, it is not uh, in any way a cut. In addition to that, there'll be non-staff savings relating to that. I can imagine that because of the, the period of lockdown, there were less travelling expenses, for example. So there, there, there are kind of one-off savings with, within the audit um, team, but I can assure you that there is no intention to, to reduce the establishment within that team. In, in terms of your wider um, observation that we have taken on and a, a, a significant uh, amount of additional work, I, I absolutely agree with that. What, what we've done as a service, and, and it will be replicated across the Council, is that we've gone through an almost continual process of redeployment and staff, where um, we, we make sure that, that, all, that staff resource is always redirected to the, the most essential areas. However, it is something that we do and will have to continue keeping under review as we move forward. And we don't know what the next stages of this pandemic are going to bring or what additional asks will be put across the teams. But that is in no way um, confined to the Chief Executive Service. It's, it's across yeah. the board. OK, thanks, Convener. Thank, thanks, thanks, thanks uh, Councillor Morgan. Um, um, the point that you raised is important, Councillor Morgan, at the first quarter, and you're, you're right to do that. We had a discussion of audit and scrutiny and that, and the planned audit work, as you know, um, is, is being planned ahead. That can change depending on what happens with COVID, 100%. And we asked uh, Ken that very question, and he was comfortable with that. So uh, we pick up your point, uh, Tommy, uh, and that's, that's absolutely fine. Agenda item 16A, I've got no other um, uh, speakers in the chat bar. Can, uh, can I ask you then to, if you can agree the recommendations on page 159? Yeah, okay. 
Um, moving on to 16B, this is a revenue monitoring report for the full council summary. Uh, a lot of the information that's in here, in fact, a lot of the members on the, on the committee of the day will, will know the figures that's here, know the details that's here. Uh, Elaine's going to speak on it. Um, absolutely, she's going to speak on it. Um, uh, but again, I, I know that he's aware of some of the, the figures, especially that's in there, given the, the information that's been given out to, to sound the board or equivalent of that. Elaine. You're on mute, Elaine. Right, apologies, apologies. Yeah, you're okay, you're okay. Yeah, yeah. The, this, this report um, does cover the, the period up to the 31st of July, so absolutely it reconciles to the position that I reported to full council at the meeting on the 13th of August and the, the verbal update that I gave at that meeting. So members will recognise the figure on the projected deficit at that time, which is £18.326 million. And that includes net additional costs as a result of COVID of 46.27 million, partly offset by additional non-specific grant income of 21.8 million. But members should, should also be aware that this position has been further updated. By way of a further update, additional income was received from the Scottish Government and the benefits of further management action um, have now been quantified. And as a result, the, the currently unmanaged element of the Council's deficit now sits at 11.8 million. And, and all parties' budget groups are aware of this and have, are currently considering options to manage the in-year budget gap, and they'll be considered at, at the full council meeting on the, the 8th of October. So given that the, the information in this, this report has already been discussed at, at full council, I don't intend to go through the details, but I'm, I'm obviously happy to take questions. Okay, any questions coming from yourselves? Um, I don't see anybody in the chat bar for um, 16B. What I will say, um, moving this forward, I think Elaine's right. The figures that are there at the moment will no doubt change. They will absolutely change. And I think given the recent announcement, both at UK level and Scottish level, about COVID, um, it may well change um, to be in a worse position. But hey, we don't know that. Anyway, um, can we agree that the recommendations on page 171 um, for agenda item 16B? You happy to agree that? Yep, okay. Moving it forward to, just bear with me, I'm too slow. Number 17, page 183 to 192. And this is a capital programme uh, 2021 monitoring report. Elaine? Right, the, the last monitoring report from me at this stage. Given the, the significant economic and financial uncertainty caused by COVID and alongside the reduction in capital grant that was provided by Scottish Government, there was a requirement to review the capital programme. So the, the Strategic Capital Delivery Group, under their terms of reference, undertook a review of the programme. And, and following this review, the programme was re reduced by 20.7 million. A spend was restricted to essential expenditure only and projects to which there was a legal commitment until we, we get to the point that the impacts of COVID are, are more fully understood. And, and this level now reflects the available resources, it ensures the affordability and also importantly provides a, an element for, for contingency for COVID-related capital costs. So the, the, the group um, agreed that, that this was the, 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 the revision that, that would require to be made to the programme, but more importantly, it agreed that work should now get underway to develop a new rolling five-year programme, which will be brought forward to committee for approval in March 21. But based on the, the revised programme, the general fund element remains on target, as you'll see from my report, although capital receipts are projected to be significantly down. The, the HRA capital programme is currently projecting an understand of, of around 21 million, and this understands within the mainstream programme. It's due to delays within the programme, mainly as a result of issues with Scottish water and the impact of COVID. 
uh, but it will be fully reported through the, the Housing and Regeneration Committee. Um, that's all I'm happy to say on this report. Okay, okay Elaine. Um, these are under page 183 to 192. Um, I've got one councillor, um, Councillor Shim. Councillor Shim. Jim, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I've lost my arrow there, Bob. I'm explaining wee... other things. Um, uh, you're a wee bit of echoey, but I think you might be okay now. On you go, Jim. Right, okay. Um, on page uh, 186 uh, to 213, it's the Community Investment Fund company. Um, the, any idea when we'll be able to get an update on that at all, Elaine, in, in terms of when it's likely to be reinstated? Elaine? If the answer is no, that's fine, but I just wondered. So the, the the community investment fund is the funding still there, but the, the recognition by the capital delivery group that we're only at the sort of feasibility stages of of, of, the, of some of these projects. So that's really in recognition of the fact that the the the, the the extended the budget that was in place previously what is not likely to be spent in the current year. But as I said, that we're about to open up the process to bring forward bids for the next five year rolling programme and, and that will be addressed at that time. There's no doubt. Um, Sorry, Bob. Sorry, you get something else here, Jim, are you okay just with that? Scale, just time scales for that. Right. Do we have any time scales, Elaine, at this stage? The, the revised programme will be brought forward and uh, for approval at the end of this financial year, March. Right, OK. OK. OK, okay thanks, Jim. Um, there are no other questions on the chat bar. Um, pages 183, um, recommendations 1, 2 and 3. Are you happy to agree? Yeah, OK, thank you. Moving on, it's the, um, this is um, the first agenda item 18. It's... Um, I think it's the first of five or six items on land and, and property. Um, and I think some of them are, are, are relatively straightforward. I think one, one uh, item 18 is straightforward as such. Has anybody got any questions um, on item 18 at all? Item 18. There's nothing in the, the chat bar on item 18. Can I ask you for your agreement on the recommendations on page 193? You have to agree with that. Agenda item 19 is where I now um, part myself. Um, uh, I'm going to um, leave um, the place. It's going to be taken over by uh, Councillor Fisher. When this item's finished, I will come back in. Thank you. Thanks very much, Bob. Um, Number 19 is the homologation of the View Park nurseries, increasing by just over 2,500 square metres. Does anyone have any questions or issues with this one? No, no, nobody, no. nobody coming in? Can we agree it? Yes? Agreed. Andrew, could you bring Bob back in for whatever he's gone? I think Councillor Barrow should still be in the meeting. I think he had a chance to move him into the lobby. Yeah, I'm back in. Is that okay? Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can hear you, convener. You put yourself on mute. Sorry, I was just saying that um, that was a wee bit different, moving out the room and coming back in again. Uh, that's a bit different. Right, agenda item uh, 20. Again, it's another positive um, uh, story moving forward. It's a good news story. We're purchasing 15 new build house for social renting. Uh, agenda item 20. Anybody get any uh, questions on, on agenda item 20? I'm looking. There's nothing in the chat bar, colleagues. Can we agree the recommendations page on 203? Yeah, OK. I'm getting annoyed with that. Um, page... Agenda item uh, 21, um, again, it's a, a good news story again. We're purchasing 22 houses for, for rent um, in the, the Christon uh, area, uh, pages 209 to 212. Um, uh, any questions on uh, agenda item 21? No. Can we agree the recommendations here on page 209? Yeah. 
I'm getting a nod. Thank you very much. Um, item 22. Um, now, this is um, an item for homologation. Um, and um, it's the ORS building. For people that um, uh, know Airdrie well, this has been a, um, a disaster area for a long while, right in the middle of the, the town. And at long last, we're now moving forward. All the details are, are there. Um, we're, we're seeking a, an homologation on the, the report for agenda item 22. Has anybody got any questions to the officers on, on 22? Um, no. Um, if not, um, are we happy to agree the recommendations on page 213? Yep. Okay. Agenda item uh, 23, the relocation of land at Morven Street, Coatbridge, um, to move from one um, in department into uh, another. Ian, you want to maybe say something? Ian Martin, are you about? Or is it James? Who's taking it? Uh, Ian can take his one container if he's, if he's, if he's, he's on the, uh, the meeting. Yes, yeah, sorry, I was just having some trouble with my, my, my mic there. Um, I thought you were away for a coffee there, Ian. Uh, no, okay, <laughs> that's okay then. Okay, mate. Um, uh, you want to come in on this because I think there was um, some, uh, a couple of councillors were a wee bit um, concerned about it. You want to? Yeah, to yeah, I'll, I'll come in. Well, this, this report seeks um, consent for reallocation of land at Morven Street and Coke Bridge. Um, for to facilitate the expansion of the Copeswood Cemetery. Um, as outlined at section 2.4 in the report, the reallocation process is normally a, de a delegated process to the Head of Asset and Procurement Solutions, where there's no objections from services or local members. However, in this, in this instance, two local members have raised objections in relation to the loss of the recreational space and um, questions as to why the playing fields have fallen into disuse. The current management arrangements for the land and pavilion area detailed, are detailed in section 2.3 within the report, um, are currently managed by um, North Lancashire mm -hmm. and they have confirmed that the site is currently surplus mm -hmm. to the current sports provision requirements. It's detailed in section 2.5 within the report, Sports Scotland and planning would be consulted on the loss of the football pitch and compensated provision may be provided in the form of upgrading existing local sports facilities to more comprehensively serve the local community. And this will be based on the advice received from, from Planning and Sports Scotland. Mm -hmm. Section 2.6 of the report uh, just details that without the, <coughs> the expansion, it's anticipated that Coxwood Cemetery will run out of wares in December 2026 and the extension could provide capacity for a further 25 years. Um, under 4 point, uh, Section 4.1 of the report, the financial impact is noted that should there be any requirement arising from the consultation with Sports Scotland to upgrade existing local sports facilities, this would need to be accounted for in future years' capital uh, programmes. OK. Well, um, thank you for that, Ian. I've got two speakers, um, Councillor Stubbs and followed by Councillor Larson. Uh, Councillor Stubbs. Thanks, Bob. Just before I, I start, I, I had problems getting into the meeting this, this afternoon, um, so I missed the declarations. I don't know, maybe somebody could give me a bit of guidance. I'm one of the two councillors that objected to this. Um, I don't know if I need to declare an interest on that basis. Um, I, I certainly wouldn't be excusing myself from the discussion, but I don't know if that's something that has to be, be noted that um, I'm going to be talking on it, but I have uh, also objected in the past. Can I clarify, Councillor Stubbs? Karine, um, do you want to maybe give a um, uh, clarification on that? Karine is, uh, sorry, is um, uh, covering uh, Archie Aiken's position, Councillor Stubbs, so she'll be able to give you um, uh, an update. Thank you. Certainly. Um, in terms of the Code of Conduct, um, members will be aware that it's the objective test um, that you have to apply. Um, which is whether a member of the public with, with knowledge of all the relevant facts would regard the interest that you have as so significant that it's likely to prejudice um, your decision um, and your role as a councillor. It's really um, a matter for, for yourself, um, councillor, uh, as you know, um, but the advice is to err on the side of caution. I would say probably in terms of being a local member and purely taking on board um, 
local interests, um, I don't think would necessarily um, put you in the territory of, you know, of having to declare an interest. <clears throat> Ideal. Thank you very much. Um, well, I mean, colleagues are obviously aware now that I'm one of the ones that have objected. And um, I do have an amendment on this issue. I've sent it to Andrew. Andrew, I apologise for sending it so late on to you. Um, it's kind of landing halfway through the meeting, but I have technical problems this morning. Um, so I don't know, Bob, if you want the, the amendment I think, distributed first. Uh, I think, uh, Alan, it would be better to, to have the amendment because your discussion will follow the amendment. Um, that would be helpful. Aye. I'll share that now on screen, and I've just emailed to members as well. I hope members can see that. <coughs> Bob, just tell me when I'm when no, to just go. Give, just, uh, just give me a wee second, Alan. I'm just double checking. I went in on the email system. I didn't know it was going to be right. Okay, on you go, Alan. Um. So this this site is um, has been been kind of left into a, a state of disrepair uh, over a number of years, um, despite the, the the number of local organisations seeking to use it, um, whether it be through North Lanarkshire Leisure itself or through community asset transfer. Um, I'll cover a few points in the report. I don't want to talk for ages on it, but we're, we're quite, quite a kind of a, a quick meeting, which has uh, worked out quite well. Um, the in, in terms of, I'll, I'll cover it point by point. In 2.3, um, the, the concern here is that there's a, a potential scaling up of complementary capacity. It's not There's not been an, an, an agreed scale up. Um, members will know that um, 10, 15 years ago, uh, the the sports complex at Espy site was, was done away with in favour of the, the schools are, are now on that site. And although there's some fantastic football pitches and uh, all, all purpose pitches on that site, um, there's not there's probably about half or maybe not even as much as half as what used to be there when it was when it was Espy site um, in, in terms of playing fields. Um, so we've already in the local area seen a, a, a massive reduction in the amount of uh, playing fields that are available locally. Um, the uh, I won't be the only one. I think I, I doubt there's, there's any councillors at, at this meeting or, or out with this meeting that's not had contact from from local organisations, whether it's uh, for youngsters or for adults to play, um, who are uh, unable to get bookings. Um, people are having to, to travel um, miles to, for for their home games um, and, and training sessions, and sometimes out with North Lanarkshire altogether um, because there's just not we don't have enough uh, playing fields available. Um, the in, in two point six, and I wonder um, if, if Ian's got this information off the top of his head or to hand. Um, from my from untrained eye, looking at the um, is Harry want me to clarify just now, or when I'm summoning? No, on you, on you go. Um, okay, on. Um, from, from my untrained eye, the site on Morven, the Morven Street playing field um, site does appear smaller to me than the, the current Coltswood Cemetery. Um, and I, I stand to be corrected, but if, if that is the case, I, I'm, I'm curious as to how a cemetery that's that's um, by 2026 will be in there for about 20 years um, is going to be full, but we expect a smaller site to last 25 years. Um, if, if you can clarify that uh, at some point. Um, the, I've got a lot of sympathy for the, the need for, for the cemetery to be expanded or for a new site to be found. We've got some time. My concern is that that, uh, that, that sports fields are a kind of easy target. There's, most members somewhere within their ward will have some uh, something that used to be a football pitch or something else um, that's now overgrown and just been kind of left. Uh, and it, it's it's almost by design. Um, if, if we don't accept bookings onto and don't cut the grass and paint the lines. And nobody, we, we can we can then show that there's no bookings on that site, um, and then it's 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 surplus to requirements. There's a definite demand locally um, for the uh, for, for this this football pitch, um, or or if, if it can be turned into to more than just a football pitch. Um, I, I get that there's maybe a bit of investment required to to make make the pavilion fit for use, um, but I would highlight um, on 4.1. Um, in fact, Ian already highlighted this that if there's any requirement. 
uh, from the consultation with Sports Scotland um, that the additional funding will have to be found in any case. Um, so if we have to find funding for this or if it's for something else, um, then that's going to be the same regardless of whether it's the, the, uh, the recommendations in the report or the amendment that I've, I've proposed just now. Um, so I would ask uh, colleagues to support um, what's on the screen just now um, and, and make sure that we're not doing away with any more uh, outdoor spaces um, for, for our local communities. Okay, um, Alan, that's your um, um, amendment. Um, do you have a, a seconder for that to make to ensure that it's informally into the system? I'm going to second it. Thanks, Bob. Can I come in and speak as well? Well, your your name's on there anyway, so yep, and you come. Thank you. Okay, so um, I, I think I'm into my third year now serving at council. Um, and every year, and I mean every year since I've been elected, I've had groups contacting me about this site. Um, asking me to make representation that they've phoned up, they've tried to make a booking, they've told that they've been told that the pitch is not available for booking. Um, later on, I think it was last year, I uh, saw the, uh, the paper come to policy and strategy, where it listed a variety of different sites that were deemed to be surplus to requirement or no longer in use. Um, and I did object to the terms used at that point because they were factually incorrect. It was not allowed to be used. It was not allowed to be accessed. Um, and as I've just pointed out, every year people have been trying to use this football site. Um, I want to, at this point as well, just take a minute to recognise um, that we are experiencing this COVID pandemic and that's brought about new knowledge um, in relation to the benefits associated with outdoor activity. Um, uh, has been, you know, safer in terms of virus transmission. Uh, and I think we have to recognise that this is a local facility and it's a local piece of land. Now, in Coatbridge North, in terms of assets, um, we've seen a lot of change recently. You know, we're going to see the town hall at Kildonan Street going. Um, we've seen the old court going. Uh, and we've just seen various sites stripped away. And this is it's a public piece of land, so I would like to ask the question, Kirvina, what consultation has been carried out with the public in relation to the land use change at this site? Um, I also want to just point out that, you know, this implication that there's been no interest in the, the land is factually incorrect because every year bookings have tried to be made. And as the land belongs to the council, if the land is in a state of disrepair, then sadly that that lands at the council's door. It's but it's been left. It's been left to to um, you know let the grass grow, etc. Um, when in fact it was a viable asset and bookings were you know trying to be made. Um, and I would ask council to to reconsider their position on this today. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Larson. Um, I've got, I think, Councillor Curran. Yep, yep, Bob. Yep. Um, and then followed by Councillor um, Cullen. Now, sorry, Councillor Curran, can you hold yep. a second? Uh, okay. Councillor Cullen, you're we're seeking, you're seeking a point of clarification. We don't have a point of clarification, understanding orders. Andrew, can you guide me on that? Uh, I think it's actually Councillor Curran who's who's, who's asked for a point of clarification. Um, but I think that will be covered by um, whatever he's got to say. Yeah, a question. I think uh, that, that's that's fine. That's OK. We'll come to yourself in a minute, Councillor Cullen. Councillor Curran. Bob, it's just on 2.5 saying here that this will go to planning. Yeah. Now, if, this, well, well, if it goes to a vote or not a vote or, a, in fact, a debate, does the members of the planning committee, if they decide... If they decide uh, either way, is that then the battle when, if and when, if this comes to planning, is that then the battle to take part in that side of it? Well, again, Karen, um, I'm looking for your guidance here. Um, uh, Councillor Curran the, as you know, the convener of planning, and he's seeking clarification on that. Can you help? You're on mute. That's it. Sure. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, That's okay. Yeah, I think it's back to um, the terms of the, co the code in, 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 in the case of declaring an interest. Um, I think that if you have um, have taken a decision on the matter previously, 
then in terms of um, planning um, decision, sorry, just if you could bear with me just one second. Um, Sorry, could I just come back to you on that? Of course, we're waiting. Uh, Thank right, you. Um, you look at that just now, and I'll go to Councillor well, Cullen. Thank you. Cullen. Can, I, can I just come back in on that? Councillor Cullen. Uh, yeah. If, yeah. If we are debating something that's going to come up in front of planning, then under normal circumstances, anyone that's in the planning would not take a view either way of until the actual thing come up to planning. Till the application come up. What I'm saying is, there's an amendment here. It doesn't matter what way it goes. If this subject comes up to planning, then anyone who's given a view could be deemed as saying that they were either for or against this prior to the application coming in front of the, the planning committee, which could show either bias either way. And that's the point number three and what I'm looking for. Convener, there's two points of order being put into the chat bar, one from Councillor Larson and one from Councillor Linden. Now, uh, point of order for Councillor Larson. What's your point of order? The, it actually hasn't been sent to planning yet, and therefore, uh, until these papers are dealt with, then we're not at that stage and we're that's, preempting that's, something. That's, that's, that... it's, it's no point of, of order It's such. It isn't. I know. However, but... I know what you're saying. It's no point of order, though. But I know what you're saying. But the convener is only um, uh, setting up a potential problem if it does do that. Um, is it councillor? The other council point of order. Who's it come in? Jordan. Jordan. Thanks, Jordan. Thanks, convener. Um, standing orders relate to uh, members' contributions and the accuracy of contributions. So if you look at standing orders, um, then there is an item there around the accuracy of a member's contribution, and I think in the interests of clarity. Um, if a member was to think when it came to planning that it was a, a matter that they'd already cast their view on, um, then they would preclude themselves from engaging in the process at that point. So um, it's not saying that the member is debarred from participating in the process at the meeting today, but if they came to planning at a subsequent date and that had come up, then the reasonable test would be that a member might feel they would, would be required to declare an interest as they've already articulated a view on it. I think that's, yeah. that's probably a helpful clarification. That's um, uh, uh, sorry, yeah, sorry. I think that's helpful, but I'll double check. Um, Councillor Linden with uh, Karine. Back to you. Have you, have you, have you been able to yes, check? Yes, I think Councillor Linden, that's correct. Um, yeah. uh, councillors required to de declare his or her interest in all meetings um, relating to the matter to, to discuss, but I think you yeah, are in terms of um, be a decision for the member to make at that time. Um, you know, at, at, at planning. Right. I'm accepting that the point of order um, raised by Councillor Linden uh, actually clarifies the position um, with that, and as such, we can proceed um, with this. Uh, Councillor, um, uh, who is it? Can I say, Bob, that I'll leave the meeting now and not take any part in this. Sorry, Councillor Carbon, um can I just say to you, you have every right to leave the meeting at any time. But the the meeting, uh, it's up to you. I'm I'm not going to say anymore. It's really up to you, up to yourself. Um, if you're going to do that, it's up to you, Councillor Cam. You're on mute, Councillor Cam. You're on mute. Sorry, I'll leave I'll leave the meeting, Bob, and that'll keep me right in case this ever comes up in front of the planning committee. Okay, I'm getting back to um, Councillor Cullen. You had something um uh, to say, Councillor Cullen. Yes, uh, thanks, convener. <clears throat> First of all, what I would like to say is that it's difficult um, in the circumstances to, to, to make decisions when we've not got all the information. Um, I think in the, the three years I've been elected in North Lanarkshire Council, uh, one of the areas I've, I've sort of taken, it, taken an interest in is the, the provision of sports, open space and play facilities for communities across um, North Lanarkshire. Councillor Stubbs quite rightly, and he, he mentioned the provision of sports facilities, but he, he did so from an anecdotal basis. I've got no document within North Lanarkshire that I'm aware of that lays out the criteria for the provision 
of open space, parks and sports fields that that communities that communities can refer to whenever they identify or perceive uh, a deficit within their area. I uh, work in West Lothian and one of the documents that I'm responsible for in West Lothian is exactly that. So I know if I was taking a sports field away in Armadale, what the provision is in Armadale, and I can evidence that there'll be no detriment to the community in Armadale should the council choose to take away a sports field in Armadale. We've not got that in North Lanarkshire. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, no, there is. I'm, I'm, sorry. I'm still. I'm still speaking. Mira. Sorry. Okay. Sorry, councillor. I'm, I'm saying that said, there is a conflict between the provision of open space, sports and play facilities, which we should protect within North Lanarkshire, and the provision of cemetery um, space for the communities within North Lanarkshire. So there's got to be a balance struck. But what I feel is that this report, as it's suggest, as it's written, doesn't tell us what the detriment is to the community in North Lanarkshire of the removal of this sports field. Councillor Stubbs has, has mentioned it, but he's mentioned it from an anecdotal perspective. I would like to see um, the, the service responsible for sports facilities and open space and play facilities within North Lanarkshire telling us what the impact of the loss of that sports field will be on that community. There will be a standard to which they should be applying, i.e. X amount of sports fields per thousand population, whatever that standard is, but at least it should be written down in black and white so that people can understand you know, what the, the impact of the, the removal of that sports field will be. Yeah. Andrew, um, we had a run there of people coming in. I think the next speaker is Paul Kelly. Is that correct? That's correct. Councillor Larson has indicated to come back in, but she's already been in once, so it's your discretion whether you allow Councillor Larson to speak again. And although, of course, the, although, of course, as a second of, um, sorry, um, yeah, no, that's just up. That's right. And Councillor Larson, you did second it there, and you, I think you've run in the chat bar. You're in again, I think. It was just that, that I had asked a no, question, no. Bob, and I didn't get the answer about consultation. Was there any consultation with the local community? That was me. Okay, clarification on that. Um, is that either coming from Ian or James? No, you, James. Uh, Kabir, I, I could come in if you wish. I think if 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 it would be helpful, I could maybe respond to some of the points that have been made. Yeah, okay. in the committee as well, just to just to uh, just to provide some clarification uh, uh, in order that members can can deliberate uh, their decision. But I could just explain the process first of all. Uh, with 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 this report, I mean, what happens with with this type of report is, in this case, we're approached as a service by environmental assets uh, because they've got a, a challenge in relation to to, to to burial space in terms, you know, and a piece of land is identified next to the to the to the burial, uh, the, the cemetery, and then we approach the the service that holds that piece of land, which in this case is education and families service, and we get that we get their views. The views is that this land uh, would is, is surplus to, to, to their, their their requirements. Now, now the sports provision in North Lanarkshire uh, is administered by Culture and Leisure at the present time, which is an alio, which the council has made a decision that that alio will come into the council at some point in the in, in the, the, the future. We cannot transfer the, the, the land. Uh, to, to culture and leisure, even under the existing circumstances, because it fits within the education and families grounds. Now, I think, I think, I think the important thing, and I'm not trying to sway the committee in any any direction. That this this is a decision which the committee has to make. This is why it's been brought. I cannot make this decision under delegated authority because there has been two objections. That's the way the process is kind of kind of written. But but the, the process is that that the, apologies to interrupt. Councillor Linden has just made a point, point of order. Sorry, yeah, Jordan. Kambira, I need to seek your, your your guidance and judgment in terms of standing orders, and I appreciate and I apologise if I make a point of order over the top of an officer at committee. Yeah. Uh, could I ask you, convener, to ask officers to make their comments relate to the questions that have been asked by members and answers to the questions only? Uh, uh, members only have one or two opportunities to come in, in the debate. It's not fair for officers to articulate a narrative other than answers to the questions that have been asked. 
Well, OK, uh, Councillor Andrew, I'm uh, actually um, OK at this stage um, that the officers can give a bit of a wider um, background um, to that. I, I, I see you shaking your head. I, I understand that. But this is an important topic, and I want to get as much information and background to it as possible. On you go, James. I think just to clarify last point, I'm trying to answer, answer the questions that, 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 that have, have been asked. The point the point the point I'm coming on to make is in terms of you know that that uh, depending on how the how the committee considers this item, uh, it goes on to the, the planning committee after the consultation with the Sport Sports Scotland. And the planning oh, committee apologies for being a councillor and has made another point of order. All right, okay. Job. Councillor London. Oh no, that's a legacy point of order. I, I, I certainly wasn't interrupting the officer a second time. Sorry, I have seen it coming up as well, Jordan. I thought it, I thought you were coming back in no, again. Absolutely right. not. And I apologise to James once again. That was that was not my fault that time, James. Right. Okay, James. Okay. Thank you. The point that, that I'm going to make is a uh, there's consultation required required by with Sports Scotland. That consultation, the results of that consultation, has to be taken account of uh, by by the council. The results of that consultation would be fed into the planning process uh, as, as part part of uh, that, that, that 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 process. So, what we can do is just answer some of the questions that have been made earlier on and to clarify uh, that 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 process. It's just to explain the process of how this paper uh, works and how it would proceed. To the next next next, next stage, uh, depending on what decision is taken by the committee, I want to stress what I said at the start. I'm in no way attempting to influence the decision of the committee. Okay, I'm um, going back to the chat bar, and I think um, the, the speaker that's to come in next is Paul Kelly, followed by Councillor Beveridge. Thank you, Kevin. I mean, I do think we need to get some clarity around the planning issue because. You know, what's been said, I mean, I'm not 100% sure if that's correct. I mean, we often take or look at decisions regarding future council proposals, whether it's building council properties, homes, building schools, other things. And we and some people sit in the planning um, committee that then takes those considerations. So it's a separate, they're separate items and haven't in the past, you know, had to declare an interest or leave meetings. Um, so I think we have to get absolute clarity from the officers around that position because there's probably a number of members on this committee that are on the planning committee, and therefore, if, if the convener has left the, the meeting, would they then have to leave the meeting? And I don't think that is a position because that's certainly a position we've had in the past when it comes to considering other committee um, recommendations or proposals, as I say, for council housing or building schools that then come to planning and all the issues that come with it. I think James has articulated the key points about why this this paper is important. You know there is capacity issues with, with the Coltswood Cemetery, and um, they need to be addressed. You know that's something that's very very important to residents in the area. I think the next process in terms of planning and consulting with Support Scotland would answer some of the queries of Councillor Stubbs and Councillor Larson around the compensation and what would be available in terms of sporting pitches. Regarding their points about um, sporting pitches that have fallen in disrepair uh, or, or other issues, I mean, I think part of the problem for North Manchester Leisure and Councils is we that we have some excellent sporting facilities and we've put significant investment in despite the significant cuts that have come to the council and come to North Manchester Leisure from the Scottish Government. There isn't a priority at government level to fund sport pitches and sport facilities, and that's also an issue that needs to be considered. Okay. Um, Councillor Beveridge. <laughs> Councillor Beveridge. You're on mute, Councillor Beveridge. Uh, thanks, to, thanks, to Vina. I've got a hang of a trouble with the, the computer this afternoon. I welcome James's in, his, his input regarding the impact assessment. This is made that I'm just echoing what Councillor Kelly said. I'm not sure whether or not this is a planning. Uh, if this goes to the planning, if we still have a vote on that, and I would really, really like uh, clarification on that before I cast my vote. Thanks. I think again we're getting. Um, I've got one or two other speakers, and then I'll go back to the monitoring officer. All that I'll give you a, a time to, to look at that. Councillor Burgess is next. Yeah, I've got a problem with that as well. Basically, I'm on planning, and uh, I just want to know if I need to leave the meeting at this time. Right. Okay. Um, I think Andrew. I think I've got through all the speakers. Councillor speak John, uh, Tom Johnson. Is Tom. Speaking. Yep. Tom's come in at the bottom. Sorry, Tom. Councillor Johnson. Hello, can you come? Yep. Can you hear me? Continue. Yep. We can hear you, Tom. Yeah. Comes up is uh, 
are the sec are the second committee who, because they are planning, can't take certain decisions on the finance and resources committee. The second question is, were we to absent ourselves from this, uh, or were we to nod the thing through? We are already expressing on the issue before we go to planning. Yep. Okay. I think. Point. Third point is that when it comes up at planning, and we have a planning style report in front of us, we're looking at it afresh, surely, and still entitled to vote on it in planning. Okay. Okay. I'm coming back to the monitoring officer um, for a bit of guidance. Can you provide that guidance? Yes, certainly. So I think the the issue today is that we were getting into um, discussions about the proposed um, development, and I think um, anything that would call into account a member's um, partiality, um, I think they need to take care around that. So. For example, if you were to express an opinion today, then it might preclude you from being able to take a decision in terms of the the planning process in due course. Right. Okay. Um, uh, that's why Councillor Curran felt the need to, yeah. to, to leave. Um, uh, who else is on the planning committee? Bob, Alan, Michael, Tom. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. myself, Bill Shields. Right. Um, the, the monitoring officer has gave a view on that. Um, uh, Alan, uh, I see if you want to come in. Sorry, Alan, you'll get a chance um, to, to wind up um, as you go forward with your um, amendment. Um, Absolutely, Bob. I was just I was just making aware that I did want to I did want to do that when I want somebody else is finished. Thanks very no, much. No, Alan, you're okay. I'll allow that. Don't worry about that. Um, so we're at the stage now um, that the monitoring officer has said that there could be a risk there um, uh, for that. It's now um, really up to you yourself to, to make that um, decision. Now, what I'm going to do, um, uh, Paul Kelly, you've, I'll let you back in, Paul. I think, I think James McKinsey also wants to come in to clarify the planning issue. Um, sorry. sorry. Sorry, I'm saying to you about turning the phone off and I've got the bloody thing. Sorry, Paul. <laughs> That's terrible. It won't let me turn it off. Sorry, wait a minute. Give me a second. Okay, I think I think it would be good to hear. I think James McKinstry wants to come in. Going back to Karen, and sorry to go back in again, Kavina, but what about all the previous occasions? And there's there's numerous occasions throughout a council or size where committees decide make decisions about things like house, house building, school building, etc. And then it goes to planning. And I've not seen in the past any guidance or requirements for councillors to then declare an interest because if that was the process, then it would be very difficult for members to sit in planning to then sit in other committees and take decisions. But I think I mean I'm not I'm just I think we need absolute clarity. If it's a case Karina is saying that is a case then we have to leave the meeting, that's fine. But we need absolute clarity and consistency on this issue. Um, I think, I think, but no, Karina. You can put yourself on mute, convener. Right. Okay. Karine, you want to clarify that yeah. one or the other? We need, we need this, we need this point clarified before we move on. I have taken advice from the monitoring officer convener, and um, I think um, anything that that would call into question a member's impartiality um, may then preclude a further decision being made um, further down the road. I suppose in relation to um, major developments um, where a decision is made in respect of a planning application or other regulatory decision. And it has to go to full council. Um, and opinions have been expressed in the application at a previous committee. Then what, members are able to take part in the decision making by the full council, provided that they do so with an open mind. Um, 
So I, I, I suppose it really is a matter for for individual yeah. members to 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 um to consider. Um, okay, okay, Karine, that's fine. Um, I'm not cutting you off, Karine, because um, we've had a, a, I think two, two clarifications for you. What I'm, I'm um, moving this on is that it's up to members themselves that they wish to do that. We're here at the Finance and Resource Committee, and we've got a paper here, and there's an amendment to a motion. Now, the amendment is completely different to the motion, completely, right? So we're going into, um, there's no other speakers um, uh, with that. I'm now going to come back to Alan Stubbs to, to wind up, and I'll wind up on behalf of the, the, the administration. Alan. Thanks, Bob. I think we've kind of got away from um, yes. the, the topic of the report and the amendment, I have to say. Um, my, my own top is worth the planning issue is that um, it, when and if the, the issue become, comes before planning, I will obviously declare an interest and I won't be taking any part in it, um, given uh, I'm quite clearly against any um, change of use on this side. Um, I think David Collins' points were, 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 uh, were, were quite good. Um, that it's uh, Absolutely, that the, um, the report really should have far more detail in it. <laughs> I'm just laughing at Cammy's cat. <laughs> Try to bat him across the face with his uh, tail. Um, there really ought to be a list of facilities and within this report locally um, so that members from out with Coatbridge North or out with Coatbridge uh, in general uh, would be able to look at that and say, you know, is there a, do we think there's enough um, pitches? Let me tell you as a local member that, 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 that I can answer your question, David, there isn't, there isn't enough pitches locally, but I don't think that that's unique to Coatbridge. I think that's across the board. I think it's across Scotland. I don't, I don't think it's even unique to North Lanarkshire. Um, so I, I, I do think um, that we, um, we we shouldn't be moving quickly. I get the point that James McKinstry, um I think it was James that, that, that mentioned that there's a, there's obviously a need for uh, cemetery space. Um, although I, th I think Davy mentioned this as well. Um, I'm sympathetic to that, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't find more space for a cemetery, but we shouldn't be doing we shouldn't be depriving communities of uh, a playing field. Um, in order to do that, where, where do we draw the line, um, and, and how would you deal with these things? Um, when Coltswood was picked, um, there must have been, you know, when, when it was when it was identified as a, a site for a cemetery, there must have been a plan in place for how long that was going to last, and what, what would be done in the future after that. Um, to pick a site that's only been the last twenty years. Um, when I think you old Monkland, I don't know if somebody's got the mic up because I can. Yeah, I, I can hear it. Is is there somebody? Got mics on, or, right? Okay, I think Alan, on you go. I mean, Old, Old Mountland was uh, was decades, decades and decades. In fact, there's still people. I know that you can't buy a a, 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 a layer there, um, but you, certainly um, people still being buried there. Um, to, to identify Coltswood, um, it's only the last twenty years. My, my question about the twenty five year thing wasn't answered. Um, how a, a site, how a, a, a plot of land that's smaller than the current site is going to last longer than the one that we've got at the moment um and i don't uh, i don't I, I did hear an answer to kirsten's question about the consultation uh, oh that's coming after the sports scotland um the sports scotland issue my final point on the planning issue if, mem if members are you, you can vote on, on this committee or the other one um doesn't I mean there's, there's no obligation to leave this meeting um on voting on this this important issue um you might just have to say it planning a canny vote at that point if it goes through. But hopefully it's not an issue. I mean, if everybody backs the amendment, it'll not go to planning anyway. Okay, we'll Alan, thank you for that. Um, we've now um, stopped the discussion. We'll now move to the vote. We've got a, a motion um, uh, from the administration and we've got an amendment. Um, is everybody happy that you know what the amendment is um, before we go to the vote? Yeah, I'm getting the nods. Right, okay. I'll, um, Andrew, um, we'll take it for you. We're doing a we're doing a roll call. Yes, and convener, can I just? I'm assuming you're moving the motion as per the report. Can I just ask if there's a seconder for that, please? Yes. Yes, I'll second that, Andrew. That's Councillor Fisher. Yep. Fisher, sorry. Sorry. I just want to inform members of a couple of things. Um, since the start of the meeting, Councillor Carson is an apology, so he's substituted by Councillor Quigley. He's on the meeting. 
Um, and also during this debate, a number of members have left the committee um, who I think are on the planning committee, councillors Cohen, Beveridge, Kelly and Redden. Um, I just want to let you know that they've left the meeting. That will be recorded in a minute. Yeah, OK. So if the members are OK, I'll now move to the vote. Um, so we've got an amendment by Councillor Stubbs and a motion by Councillor Burrows. If you can indicate, as always, whether you're supporting the motion and amendment or if you are abstaining. I'll read your name down after this order. Councillor Dinesh Ashraf. Um, voting for the amendment, please. Councillor Junaid Ashraf. Hello? No. Hello? Hello? Right, Councillor Ashraf, we can hear you. Councillor Ashraf, you vote for the motion amendment or abstaining? Sorry, can you speak again? You're on mute. Amendment. Amendment, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Burgess. Amendment. Amendment. Councillor Burrows. Mo motion. Motion. Councillor Campbell. Yeah. Motion. Councillor Michael Coyle. Might have left the meeting, Councillor Cullen. Is that, for, is that for me, Andrew? Yes, it is. I'm amendment. Amendment. Uh, Councillor Doherty. Hi, Councillor Doherty. Motion. Motion, thank you. Uh, Councillor Duffy. Motion. Councillor Farouk. Councillor Farouk. Amendment. Thank you. Councillor Feeney. <laughs> Councillor Feeney. Amendment. Thank you. Councillor Fisher. Motion. Councillor Gurley. Motion. Councillor Graham. Has left the meeting, Andrew. Councillor Graham showing up in the list of participants. Hi, right, Councillor Graham, are you on the call? I don't know if I can. No. Uh, Councillor Hume. Amendment. Councillor Catherine Johnson. Councillor Catherine Johnson. What? Yeah. Amendment. 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 Councillor Tom Johnson. Amendment. Yes, thank you, Councillor Johnson. Uh, Councillor Tom Johnson. Amendment. Councillor Jones. Motion. Councillor Larson. Amendment, Andrew. Thanks. Councillor Linden. Amendment. Thank you, Andrew. Councillor McGregor. Amendment. Councillor McKendrick, I think, has left the meeting yet. Councillor McManus. Amendment. <coughs> Councillor Morgan. Motion. Councillor O'Rourke. Yes, you're still here. So can you say that again, please, Councillor O'Rourke? Motion. Motion, thank you. Councillor Quigley. Motion. Councillor Redden has left. Uh, Councillor Shields has left the meeting. Uh, Councillor Stubbs. Amendment. Councillor Annette Valentine. Amendment. And Councillor Watson. Amendment. Okay, thank you. The amendment has received 16 votes, the motion 10, there were no abstentions, so the amendment is carried. Okay. Um, next item on the uh, agenda 
is agenda item 24. Um, this is a paper here for you. It's asked to, to note um, on page 225 to 230. Are you happy to agree to note the paper? Agreed. 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 Um, same applies to agenda item 25. Um, on page, um, two, two, three pages, uh, recommendation is to note the content of the report. Are you happy to agree that? Yep, you happy to agree that? Yeah, I, that is the, the, the meeting closed. And again, thank you for your attendance. And um, I'll see you all at the next full council meeting. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bye. Chair. Bye. Thank you.